Hi, Aaron. Hi, Bruce. All right, now I'm off mute. Howdy, DJ. I'll remute myself. Been too long, yeah. my friend. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. We're a couple minutes early. Anybody who's uh, tuning into the delayed webcast, feel free to skip forward probably four or five minutes while we do preliminaries. Hey, DJ, this is Britt. Hi, Britt, how you doing? God, Dave is also here with me. We're at training camp. Okay, hi, Dave. <laughs> hey, how are you doing, DJ? Good, good. Hey, Peggy, it's Dave. I got a question for you on international judging, uh, if you got a second. In uh, in terms of if I wanted to go, I'm already a SEVA, one of our SEVA judges, but if I wanted to go do some portion of WAC next year, would I need some judging stuff uh, this year? Yes. You have to have your... Um ranking index from our latest nationals because they look at that before they ask you to to uh, before you get the invitation to come and judge or be an assistant yeah okay just checking i, I thought that was the case uh when we, when we signed up for judging just wanted to be clear i didn't want to miss the opportunity so i just wanted to make sure i I understood that I probably had to get some judging in this year or uh, wouldn't be eligible for the calling next year. Yeah, are you, um, well, for calling, you might not have to. I'm not sure. Um, no, I think you do. Because we didn't do any last year. So there's no, there's yeah. no SEVA, you know, points because we didn't do any PZ stuff last year. Right. Well, what they did for 2021 is they carried over from 2019 because pretty much nobody did anything in 2020. Right. Um, and then the one that I was supposed to judge at this summer, they canceled the contest. Sure. Right. So it's, it's been a little sideways. Spanky probably knows better than I do about what's, what's what on that. Are, uh, David, are you scheduled to judge unlimited? Right now I wasn't, I mean, I applied for it, but I don't think the DJ or Alice knew that uh, I was a, I was a SIVA rep and that, I mean, I, I put in, you know, DJ's email said, Hey, if you're a SIVA rep and you want to be considered, then you sign up for unlimited, which I did, but we didn't, I don't think we ever got the dots connected that um, I wanted to. And so right now I'm an alternate uh, you know, kind of a general alternate, but I'm not uh, on the unlimited line right now. Okay. So I just want to make sure I, I didn't want to, I still, I would like to do it. And I would, I, and I'm, I'm interested in going over to the next WAC. Um, you know, not, obviously I understand we pay our own way and everything, but it's, it's interesting to me. I wouldn't have signed up for it if I didn't want to go do it. Right. And we can talk about it offline. You don't pay all of your way. I just think it would be fun. I've always done international stuff being a Navy guy. So I'm, I like, I like doing it anyway. And I think it, it would, uh, I would, I would enjoy being, I think I'd be additive to it. Anyway, I just, uh, you were a good resource. I saw you on the camera here. I'm like, I think Peggy probably knows the answer to this. Yeah, Peggy might know. <laughs> Okay, just giving folks about one more minute and I'm making quick notes of uh, everybody I see on here so I know who's attended and who still needs to attend. Uh, Jerry wants you to know that he's here too, not just me, DJ. Okay, good to know, thanks. Hi, Jerry. Hey. Okay. All righty. Well, I think we'll get going here. Um, just by way of um, preliminary logistics, 
Uh, I would ask everyone to stay on mute uh, unless uh, you have something to say. Uh, if you do want to interrupt me, uh, that's not a, that's not a problem. Um, just when you're done, uh, please go back on mute. Otherwise, uh, it turns into a, a nightmare of a cacophony. We, I chose to use this instead of the um, EAA webinar software, just so we could be more interactive. With EAA, your only choice is to uh, uh, submit questions by text, and I, that seemed a little sterile for what we're doing here. So uh, that's that. Jeff Granger. Hi, Jeff. And OK, I think I captured everybody who's logged on so far. So welcome to the refresher training. Oop, there we go. Everybody see my screen? Anybody not see my screen? <laughs> we're on the topic slide right now. All right, these are the topics we're going to cover, why we're here, who's doing what, basic grading, figure-specific grading, y-axis, zeros, averages, presentation, special glider stuff, uh, what I like to call 52-card pickup when everything goes to hell in a handbasket. Um, I'm going to do a little talking for Doug Bartlett about expedited operations, but he may want to add a few things there, uh, and then we'll just wrap it up. I'm going to try and bang through this in 90 minutes or so. Uh, there's a fair amount of slides and a fair amount on them, but this is a refresher. We're not training you for the for the very first time, so I'm I'm hoping that uh, we can we can zip through the material pretty quickly. Uh, Doug did ask, and I sent out an email request, but I'll just reinforce it here. Please bring a VHF radio. When uh, Doug asked me that, he said there were about 10 radios short. I've since gotten people who, of their own initiative, um, emailed and said they were bringing radios and that totals up to seven. So I think we're, we're rapidly getting there. But any of you um, who have a VH radio, VHF radio, just please bring it with you. Put a little uh, sticker on it with your name so it doesn't get lost or misplaced. But we really do need those. OK, mission is the same as it is in any other contest, just to accurately rank the pilots, not, not to make anybody feel good, feel bad, or anything else, just to rank the pilots. And so in my mind, it doesn't matter a ton if your scores are all between seven and nine, or if you score between three and eight most of the time, as long as we're ranking the pilots accurately, we're doing our jobs. Okay. This training is required under the uh, policy and procedure manual, section 501, uh, which covers national championship events. Obviously it's a premier event, and there are a few special rules in effect that we'll cover. Uh, the competitors are, are putting everything they have into this contest, and so, of course, they deserve the best judging we can give them. Here's the judging assignments as of this moment. If you're unaware of these or uh, you want to study it at your leisure, you could always hit your print screen button right about now and capture, a, capture an image of this. Um, but your chiefs are Hector Ramirez, myself, Tony Wood, Peggy Reedinger you'll notice that every category except unlimited power is going to have gliders in it. So for the great majority of you on the call, uh, we will be needing to pay close attention to the glider rules because I know a lot of parts of the country don't ever see a glider uh, in their normal regional contests. Um, I did get a text. Um, well, well, we'll leave that for later. All right, moving on. The very basic, basic grading criteria Every figure starts as a 10. We deduct for imperfections in real time as they occur. Errors are downgraded, corrections are not. So I brought with me Mr. Spiffy red biplane, right? If this biplane does a snap roll and goes 365 degrees instead of 360, you downgrade the five, but if the pilot fixes it, no downgrade, right? If on the other hand, they do a 365 degree snap and hold that into the next figure and you still see it, then that's a second downgrade on the subsequent figure and it's the pilot's job to decide whether they want to make it glaringly obvious that they over-rotated by fixing it or just hope you didn't notice, okay? But it's not your problem. You deduct for any errors you see, uh, but you don't deduct corrections. The upper categories, you're gonna see a lot of complex figures and the uh, diagram below comes right out of judges school. Uh, it's an example that Wes Liu put together. He said, if we look at this first vertical up with a three of four and a one and a quarter snap opposite and layout, and the pilot over rotates 15 degrees, well, it's a seven. Okay, and then the second figure, 
maybe three, another three points worth, that's another seven, the last figure, three more points worth of deductions, that's three figures with 7.0 in a row. If you took those same figures and smushed them together into an N and had the same downgrades, it's a 1.0, okay? Do not be afraid of the low score. Uh, I've had people come up to me and say, how could you give me a four on that? And I said, did you see what I gave everybody else? You were actually better than everybody else. Don't worry about it, okay? Deduct what you see. <clears throat> Angular errors, of course, are one point per five degrees. Obviously the most, not obviously, but I believe it's the single most common deduction. This applies to the flight path for horizontals. Doesn't matter if you're going slow, nose high, going fast, nose level. The flight path on a horizontal must be parallel to the horizon. And 45s and verticals, of course, are attitude. So a steep 45, shallow 45, just about right. Similar for verticals, right? Doesn't matter what the wind's doing to the aircraft, we're judging attitude there. <coughs> Excuse me, and one point per five degrees of imperfection. I'll remind you about the zero lift axis, particularly those of you judging lower categories. Um, if you're watching a clipped cub, a T cart, a Cetabria, Decathlon, a Super D, Extreme D, they all have wings with a positive angle of incidence, which means that when they're vertical and the cord line of the wing is vertical, the fuselage will look positive and vice versa on the down line where the fuselage will end up looking a little negative. Okay, so don't be too quick to deduct for aircraft that you know have uh, a positive incidence wing. We're always tempted to look at the fuselage line, but you're supposed to look at the wing cord line if you can. We already talked about over and under rotation, one point per five degrees of error there. Any torque in a hammerhead pivot, and I'll demo that when we get there, but you know what it is. That could be pitch or yaw or both during a hammerhead pivot as opposed to just a clean rotation. Dragging a wing on a lineup is another example of an angular error. Okay. For radii, we deduct for each change. As you know, there's no fixed downgrade. There's no objective measurement for that. Uh, but whatever criteria you use, you're supposed to be consistent. Um, we know that there has to be a distinct horizontal line between figures, and if not, it's no line between, that's one point off the figure before and the figure after. Quite often I'll hear on the judge's line, someone's coming down out of a figure, they get to about here and the judge says 8.0. Figure ain't over yet. You gotta hit horizontal and draw a line. Feel free to inhale and be ready to say 8.0, but the score should not be awarded until you see that horizontal line. Okay, so we've talked about the one and five rule. We've talked about deducting for radii. Next is the one, two, three rule, as it's sometimes called, and that's centering rolls on interior lines. Okay. The line before the roll sets the standard as far as length goes. Then you have some period for the roll, some extra line gets drawn, and then a line after. If there's any visible difference, one point off. If the line after is twice as long or half as long, as the line before it's two points, worse than that is three. Absolutely no line before or no line after is four. But then there's a weird kink in the rule that says, if both lines are missing entirely, that's only a two point deduction. And I have seen this happen with gliders. Um, we get to interact in Colorado where I am with the United States Air Force cadets who, uh, who compete in gliders, and they are so poor on energy, they'll often kind of just hit a line. The instant they hit it, they'll roll, and the instant they're done rolling, they'll get off the line, okay? And that's just a two-point deduction, as opposed to pull up, roll, and immediately get off the line with no line after, that would be four. So that's a bit of an, an odd kink in the rules there. All right. By lack of comments, I'm going to optimistically assume no one has any questions, comments, or concerns about any of this. But again, you're invited to break in if, uh, if need be. Okay. Rolls before and after a radius, like an element or a split S, there must be a brief but perceptible pause. If the pause is significantly 
a word from the rule book longer than necessary, deduct at least one point. So you don't want to be too trigger happy if the aircraft comes up, hits the line one potato and then rolls. That's not so bad. But if they're up there and it's one potato, two potato, three potato, now you're starting to add up some deductions. And at some point you're going to decide that it's just the wrong figure. I can't tell you where that point is, but um, usually it's fairly uncontroversial. Either way, the pilot's not going to get a really good score. If a roll is integrated with a radius, like a roll on top of a loop, an avalanche, that sort of thing, the radius must continue during the roll. If a straight line is drawn, minimum two-point deduction. Should have put that on the slide, but I didn't. And the roll or roll combo must be centered about the top or bottom of the loop, as the case may be. And it's one point per five degrees of misalignment. We had quite a go around a couple of years ago about, well, if you start five before the apex and then 15 after the apex, that's 10 degrees difference must be two points off. Or is it just that if you shifted the roll five degrees, that would have fixed it, therefore it's one point off. And we decided on the latter, the lesser deduction, and that's what this example down here states. Okay. Also, by way of quick clarification, if that's a roll combination, like let's say a four of eight and a half roll, same direction, okay, not sure that's legal, but anyway, if you were to do that, um, the four of eight is obviously going to take more time than the half roll, but there's no expectation that the four of eight finishes exactly at the apex and the half roll goes after that. It's just the very beginning and the very end of the roll combo that we care about, okay? DJ? Oh, yes. One question on the back uh, slide. <clears throat> I thought you said there must be a brief a perceptible pause. And I thought that was maybe should be, can be a brief but perceptible pause. It's a good question. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I, I don't remember. Uh, maybe you'd be kind I, enough to pull up the rule book and, and have a look and let us know what you find. Is that okay, Bill? Supposedly, in the old days, there wasn't supposed to be a pause, but you could have a very brief pause, but it wasn't mandatory to make the way you made it sound. Yeah, you're probably right. Um, I don't know, if somebody wants to just pull up the real book real quick and check that, I'd be happy to come back to that when we get to, uh, once somebody has an answer on that. That's a, good, that's a real good question. Okay, moving on. Um, now we're going to talk about figure specific grading criteria. Um, family 0.0, .0 are wing overs. Uh, you will see these potentially in gliders. I uh, can't remember if they're applicable to sportsman power or not, but uh, if you see one of these drawn this way, it's not a 180 degree turn, it's a wing over. All right, and you can tell the difference by the fact that there are these little 45 degree radii drawn onto the arrestee figure there. Okay. If this were a 180 turn, these lines in and out would both be straight. So it's a climbing coordinated turn. At the top of the climb, let's see, I'm going to start it this way. At the top of the climb, you should see 90 degrees of heading change, wings vertical, perpendicular to the horizon, fuselage parallel to the horizon. And then the pilot smoothly brings the the turn out on the other side. And I realize I'm not doing a great, great job of framing this, but I think you all know what I'm talking about. So come up like that, get to 90, and then roll back out in the other direction. Okay. As far as deductions go, there must be a 90 degree heading change, one point per five degrees, perpendicular wings, one in five, fuselage parallel to, parallel to the horizon, one in five, any change in the rate of roll or turn is half point or one point, depending on severity. I think the rule book says up to one point deduction, right? So that's either half or full point. Any stoppage of the roll or the turn is a full one point deduction. Okay. There's no criteria for how steep the climb has to be, um, how fast it has to be, anything like that. You just have to achieve that 90 degree heading change and get the wings and uh, perpendicular and the fuselage horizontal. 
The other two pseudo figures that I see um, defines, but Aresti does not, are the quarter up clover and the quarter down clover. And these are full loops with a quarter roll evenly integrated, I should say evenly integrated, with either the first or second half of the loop. Of course, there's 90 degree heading change, one and five for any error. Radius must be wind corrected. Um, I'll say that these are challenging to, to watch, right? Because they're either starting on the Y and somehow rolling onto the X or starting on the X and then coming at you on the Y. So either way, you're watching half the loop off axis, uh, but you do what you can on that. You can measure height with your thumb, that kind of thing. One point deduction for any change in the roll rate and then your normal downgrades for any imperfections in the radius. Those of you judging uh, sportsman, uh, sportsman glider, there is in the known a quarter up clover and it's drawn very oddly by open arrow. And that's, I copy pasted that right here into the uh, presentation. So when you see that, uh, you won't be scratching your head going, what the heck kind of figure is that anyway? Okay. And perhaps our sportsman chief will uh, remind you of that during the known briefing. Hey, DJ. Yes. Um, so the rule book on looping lines with connected rolls, it's 27.11.1 and 2. And it says, when a looping line is immediately preceded or followed by one or more rolls, i.e. rolls not centered on a straight line, there may be a pause between the roll and the looping line. Then point 2 says, if the pause between the roll and the looping line is substantially more than necessary, deduct at least one point. Okay, thanks, Britt. So it is optional. Um, and thanks, Bill, for pointing that out. Appreciate it. Okay, continuing on through uh, figure specific grading criteria. Family one, it's all the lines and angles. The radii need not match. The line lengths need not match, okay? Uh, very, very occasionally, I'll still hear somebody say, well, the, uh, the top radius didn't match the bottom radius. That was like 25 years ago. Radii do not need to match in family one. And there's nothing else special about them, really, that we haven't already talked about. Family two's turns and rolling turns, and there's some general constraints, constant altitude. You have your choice of one point per 100 feet or one point per five degrees, okay? The rate of turn must be constant up to one point deduction as the rate varies. So if you see a slight variation, maybe a half a point off, big variation, a full point off, and a full point for any stoppage, any complete stoppage in the turn. Okay. And then at the end of it, if the exit heading is incorrect, also one point per five degrees, no surprise. Okay. We all know in competition turns, minimum 60 degree bank. Uh, if it's less than that, one point per five degrees. Okay. The aircraft must not turn during the bank in or the bank out. So if you see this, it's a blended entry. One point per five degrees of heading change during the roll. Lastly, and I'm not sure how, that this gets called very often, the rate of roll out must match the rate of roll in. So you get a lot of eager beavers who come in bank hard, rip it around, and now they're out of airspeed and they kind of just roll out gently, okay? That is a one point deduction. One question. Go, oh. please. No, I, I think you're gonna cover it here. Okay, all right, if I don't uh, bring it back up. Well, yeah, the backup slide, you only address heading all five degrees, but if, if the aircraft finishes on heading with uh, roll left, it's also 1.5 degrees, correct? Yes, it is. And, and you're right. That's on the next slide, rolling turns. Okay. The, this, If the exit heading is incorrect, is a deduction regardless of whether it's a plane turn or a rolling turn. So, gotcha. so yep, here we go into the rollers and, and many more criteria for those. Obviously, the rolls have to be in the right direction, either inside, outside, or a combo. Otherwise, it's a hard zero. Uh, good thing to have your assistants help you watch. If the competitor starts rolling the wrong way, let's say it's supposed to be an outside roller and they do this and go, oh crud, and switch, 
you deduct one point per five degrees, it is not a hard zero. Okay, uh, we litigated this pretty extensively uh, this spring, um, and uh, this is the way it is. We could argue, make good arguments for either interpretation, but we had to pick one, and this is the interpretation. So if they start rolling out when they should go in, vice versa, it's one, one in five, unless they get all the way to the point where it's a 0, 0.0 or even worse, a hard zero. If you think you saw a snap roll, that's a hard zero during the roller. Uh, that'll be a PZ for unlimited, but we're gonna talk about that explicitly later. I'll just put an asterisk for you unlimited judges to put that in the back of your heads for the moment. Rate of roll must be constant, half or a full point per variation. Any stoppage of the roll is a full point. If the wings are not level at a roll reversal, where you go from inside to outside or vice versa, one in five. The roll and the turn must finish simultaneously. And Bill, this was your point, uh, that if there's any roll remaining or any turn remaining, it's one in five. Okay. Now, let's say you're watching a 180 roller and uh, with two to the inside and it gets to here, it's done 90 and, the, and we're nowhere near done or we're way ahead or behind on the roll. At this moment, there is no deduction yet because it's not finished, okay? Don't worry about what happens as the aircraft passes through the x-axis or the y-axis. All we care about is, did they keep the rate of roll constant and the rate of turn constant? And where did they end up at the very end? And if they can match the rate of roll and the rate of turn and don't change them and everything comes out in the wash at the end, it's a 10. And otherwise, we have plenty of opportunity to deduct them for being off heading, roll remaining, stoppage of roll, stoppage of turn, all that stuff, right? Okay, we never see family three, there is no more family four, we go right to family five. On the hammerheads, line lengths don't matter. Radii don't need to match. Um, look for any torque during the pivot, right? Where instead of the aircraft doing that, you see it kind of doing some of this, right? And it's one point per five degrees of pitch and or one point per five degrees of roll during the pivot, okay? The aircraft may displace laterally or vertically during the pivot by a half wingspan, so a half span. So this plane could do that and it's no deduction, but if it pivoted about the wingtip, that would be a full span and that would be a one point deduction. Also, and John Morrissey brought this to light uh, this spring, there's still something in the book that says if, the, uh, if there's lateral displacement due to wind drift, meaning the aircraft slides laterally but not flying over vertically, that's not deducted. So if there's a strong wind in this direction and the pilot, I'm gonna start it over here, does this where the aircraft isn't climbing but still gets pushed, that is not a deduction. And you need to do your best to just factor that out. Does that make sense? Okay, silence gives consent on that one, I guess. It's, a, it's an interesting uh, um, issue though, because there are wind gradients at different altitudes in the box. And at the top of the hammerhead, you may not know what the winds are or have seen the winds seeing where they're pushing someone. And you might be only able to judge what you see the aircraft motion being. Yes, exactly. That's very true. And the, um, the only thing you can say about that, um, sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing who's talking. Was that Jeff? Uh, I'm sorry, it was Dave Taylor. Dave Taylor, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so your, your tip off on that, let me get my own picture back so I make sure I do this in frame for you, is if it was a real flyover, the airplane would be going up and over. If it's wind pushed, it would just be going over without any climb in the alt any altitude climb during the pivot, right? So I think visually it's possible to, to figure out which is which, even if the pilot doesn't know what's about to happen to them. Yeah, I think that in real time, it, it might be harder to uh, figure out whether it was a wind push or not. Uh, of course, we wanna give the benefit to the competitor 
Yes. But uh, but it might not be quite so clear cut. Well, if you can explain to me how to make an airplane do this, fly sideways while pivoting, I'd love to. <laughs> I'd love to know, and I'll go out and sure. try that. <laughs> okay. All right. So that brings us to tail slides. And uh, the rule is that the aircraft must back up at least one half of the fuselage length, hard zero if not. And that's another one that would be a PZ for unlimited. Uh, but for the most of the rest of us, a hard zero. The aircraft obviously has to flop in the right direction. Dashed line is a wheels up slide. Solid line is a wheels down slide, right? We want to watch for any cheat. The pilot wants to make sure the airplane is going to go the right way. So on a wheels up slide, they may be a little negative up to make sure they get it to flop the correct direction. One point per five degrees there, just like any other vertical line. And there's no deduction for pendulums. So they're going to come down, probably go past the vertical, come back, maybe even hunt a little bit, and then hit the down line. At some point, that hunting becomes deductible, in my opinion, but it's probably not something we're going to see out of experienced unlimited pilots. For gliders, it's any visible slide. It doesn't have to be a half a fuselage. That's correct. And, and everything I'm saying up to this point is 100% about power. And we're going to cover the glider exceptions at the end. And, and that is definitely one of them. The glide, if you think that glider backed up an inch, that's good enough. OK. All right, so tail slides are relatively straightforward. Uh, loops and eights. A reminder that square diamond octagon loops, the first line sets the length standard. And for every other line segment, it's the one, two, three rule, right? One for visible variation, two to one, worse than two to one. Okay. All radii must be the same size as well, which is why you should never, ever, ever put a square loop in your free. Um, it's a bear to yeah. get those radii. I have, the a, same I have size. a question on the one, two, three loop, uh, DJ. Yeah. Go ahead. Let's talk. Let, let's do a diamond loop, and let's say that there's you know some four of eight on the first roll, and it it was takes forever, and it, you're in a one design. So by the time you get done doing the four of eight or whatever it is, and you get uh, onto the second leg, you you just don't have any energy. So um, that leg, let's say that leg is uh, three to one short, uh -huh. and then they come down, and there's an inverted snap, and let's say that leg relatively well matches the first leg and okay. then you're out of energy you know and you got to get done and so the last leg is really quick so now you've had two of the legs that are a three to one shortness you know the first leg was big the third leg was big and the two on the other sides are just tiny 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 yep that that's a, that's a six deduction right yep that's 4.0 score yes sir yep, yep. and um you know it's uh, it's tough to fly uh, unlimited in one design, that's for sure. So, yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, a reminder also that on square and octagon loops, the final line must be at least as long as the first line. Every other figure in the world, when you hit level and draw a line, it's done, but not for squares and octagons. The final line must be at least as long as the first. If it's even a hair shorter, it's no line between one point off the loop the um, diamond, the square octagon loop, one point off the subsequent figure. Okay. It's fine if your uh, vertical line on a on a square loop of say 300 feet, and then your exit line is 1,000 feet. That's fine as long as you exceed that initial 300 feet. You're good. Okay. If we see any reversing loops of any kind there must be no line between the segments. So in this example here, you must go from the inside pull and then instantly switch to pushing. If you pause and draw a line there, minimum two point deduction. And because they're loops, the radii uh, must be constant. Okay. On horizontal S's, the radii must be the same size and the entry exit lines must match the tops and bottoms of the radii. Okay, which is another way of saying that you got to make the length of this 45 line just right. Okay, so if you start at 2,000 feet, you would finish this um, this 45 line in the initial one eighth loop there at that same altitude, 2,000 feet, and then go on up from there. On the horizontal eights and super eights, um, 
horizontal eight classically is a Cuban eight, a super eight is 345 lines and two radii, right? All the radii have to match, the altitudes of the radii have to match, sorry, size of the radii must match and their altitudes must match. Two point deduction if the 45 entry exit line is short, initial or final 45 lines may be extended. I really should have put diagrams in here, sorry about that. Uh, if they incorporate multiple rolls, meaning more than 360 of rotation or any two unlinked rolls. Okay, that's a lot, that's a lot to remember. And um, what I would recommend is um, to go over the sequences, figure out which ones have these restrictions, which figures have these restrictions in them, the horizontal S's, horizontal eights and super eights, and just make some kind of a mark so that you know what you're looking for on those. Um, if I were writing the grading criteria today, I'd think that I would say this would be overboard. This is too much for a judge to remember in real time. So I personally am gonna cheat a little bit by, um, by annotating the sequences ahead of time so I know which ones to look for all these criteria on. Okay. Family hey, eight. DJ? Yes. Can, can I interject? Uh, it's important to note that that exception only applies to the entry and exit 45s and not to the intermediate 45s. So regard the complexity of the figure and whatever is happening on that intermediate 45 between those two loops, those two loops always, always have to be at the same altitude and the same size. Okay. Yep. Yep, thanks. That was Jerry. That was Watson. Watson, sorry. Not not doing a good job of recognizing voices today. Sorry. Yep. Because it's called Brit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. All righty. So moving on then, uh, family eight. Um, we'll see a lot of Humpty Bumps. You all know that the radii need not match even the double Humpties, right, where there's two looping segments on them. Um, the pull to vertical is, is its own radius, the pull over the top is its own radius, the pull around the bottom is the own radius, and the cap off at the end is its own radius. None of them have to match as long as they're all nice and round, no deductions. No criteria on line lengths. Uh, the main thing here, I think, is to watch for the perfect half loops at the top or the bottom on the 45 lines, okay? And I always follow the plane up with my thumb. And when it stops, the, when it leaves the vertical and begins the radius, I leave my thumb there. If it flies around, I have a nice reference point to see if it capped low, high, or just right on the money. Okay. But do whatever works for you on that. Uh, reversing P loops and one and a quarter loops, uh, nothing really new to learn here, I don't think. Same as before, if there's any line. Uh, like I mentioned, between the two radii where it switches from inside to outside or vice versa, two-point deduction. Radii must be the same because they're looping figures. Okay. Figure-specific grading criteria, uh, 9.1 through 9.8, so your slow and hesitation rolls. Uh, in general, the roll rate must be constant, and it's one point per variation. Okay. Also, the CG track of the aircraft must not change during the roll, although there's no specified deduction for barreling, for example. Right? You just want to see it proceed on a constant track. Okay. When it comes to hesitation rolls, um, well, any of the rolls, it's 1.5 degrees of under or over rotation, uh, and that applies in hesitation rolls, obviously, to each and every one of the stops. The roll rates between the points must match one point off per variation. The duration of the stops must match one point per variation. Now, if it takes you one second to roll and you hold it for three seconds, that's fine as long as the next roll is one second and the next pause is three, right? The roll rate doesn't have to match the duration of the stop, although many pilots do that. Um, but the roll rates have to match each other and the stops have to match each other and that's it. And obviously you have to see a full stop each time, otherwise it's a hard zero on the figure, missing point. Slowing down and then accelerating past it, people will say soft point. Um, my opinion, there's no such thing. You stopped or you didn't. 
There's an interesting thing, uh, interesting, that's from Dave Taylor again, yeah. uh, that I've noticed on something like a hammer with a two point roll on the down line. And they get done with a hammer and they do the first roll and they're, they're doing a full deflection roll. And, but, they're, but they're only going 70 miles an hour, and, but they do a full deflection. And then they pause and then they do another full deflection, only the next time they're doing 130. And that second roll is much faster uh, the, and they and people just like unconsciously you know do a full roll but the rates end up being different so i think it's something that we should pay attention to yep yeah thanks that is a good point and and the opposite happens right where you you're on a vertical up and you go bang on the first one and then the second one kind of mushes because you're sure. out of you're out of uh airflow over the ailerons right okay that brings us to snap rolls and i say the nose must pitch up what i really mean is towards the canopy or down for a 9.10 figure, towards the wheels, if you will, uh, followed by auto rotation. And if not, that's a hard zero, okay? You gotta see pitch in the correct direction. You have to see auto rotation. And oh, by the way, this is another PZ if you're uh, doing unlimited, but again, we'll, we'll cover those in detail shortly. If you see the yaw or the roll begin before the pitch change, so the plane's coming at you and you kind of see some of this, they load it up and then it goes around. One in five for every uh, early yaw change or roll change. Okay. You can pitch first and then yaw and roll, or you can pitch yaw and roll all at the same time, but you can't yaw or roll first. If the auto rotation ceases early, uh, one in five. Okay. Sorry, I'm having a hard time juggling screens and thumbnails of people and stuff. Um, bum, bum, bum. Yeah. So if it if it stops snapping at 350 degrees and they're supposed to go to 360 and they aileron on the last 10, that's two points, right? Once the roll ends, the aircraft must resume its prior flight path if it's horizontal or its prior attitude, if it's vertical. Okay, so 45 up is maybe a good example. If they do the full snap, it's okay that the airplane leaves the, leaves the attitude, right? I mean, obviously you gotta pitch up to get the snap to happen, but when you're done, it has to go back right to that same 45. Otherwise one point per five degrees. Okay, uh, and as I just alluded to, any lateral displacement during a snap is not a downgrade. You particularly see those in half snaps. I was trying to um, ground critique Bob Freeman years and years ago. Hi, Bob. Uh, and every time he did a half snap, the plane would go boink and it would just move. And we eventually decided that was just aerodynamics and there's no way around it. And uh, the rules allow for that. Next up are spins, 9.11 upright, 9.12. DJ? Sorry. Yeah, Hector, is that you? Yeah, excuse me. Sorry, I was a little late. Um, no worries. On the, on the snaps, uh, on a vertical line, like after a half loop, you have a snapping element. How do you grade if they climb uh, in the snap? So they set their line, they do their snap, and they end up 100 feet high. I do not know of any downgrade for that. If anyone does... Um, this would be a good time to point it out, but I don't believe that's a deduction. Yeah, sometimes you can see a very significant change in the line. So I guess in a way it's a lot like your lateral displacement, except more in the uh, uh, in the superior direction. But uh, yeah, or, yeah. Or Hector, maybe, I've seen maybe people downgrade just... for it, and I've seen most people don't seem to downgrade for it. So I just want to know what the party line is. Yeah, or maybe this, maybe they're, maybe they are climbing into the snap uh, and they should have done it a little later when they were actually on a CG horizontal before they got going. So if they climbed a hundred foot during the snap, I would actually downgrade that some just, just it should be relatively level uh, it, during the snapping portion. So, uh, you know, if they climbed a hundred feet during the snap, I think they started it at the wrong attitude. Well, David, uh, David and DJ, sorry to interject this. We fought that a um, number of years ago during one of Morrissey's training camps where the aircraft would jump in the half snap. So you're along this line and it just in a half snap, it's really common if you 
pull in, instead of getting simultaneous pitch roll yaw, if you pull first and then do the pitch roll yaw, the aircraft will naturally climb. And like DJ said, I don't know that there's a degrade, but it does look unnatural. So that, that's a great question, Hector. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, and a half snap sure. might be something. A hundred foot still seems like a lot. I mean, if you plant the plane, it's not going to vertically displace before you snap it. Mm -hmm. Not a hundred feet is not. Yeah, that's a good point. It's maybe worth bringing up um, uh, in rules committee discussions for the coming year. Um, but uh, at, I mean, I think yeah, unless need, someone can unless someone can quote chapter and verse, I don't believe that that's uh, there's presently any downgrade for that in the rule book. Okay, that may be something to try to clean up maybe before the contest, just so that everyone's on the same page. I, I, I don't think uh, I, that's the kind of thing that needs a lot of deliberation, I think. Uh, DJ? Yeah? Dave, Dave Watson again. I, I, I think just the contrary, the, the rules are pretty explicit on this. If it's a horizontal line, the figure, the base underlying figure dictates that it's a horizontal line and the CG of the plane must stay on the horizontal line. There's no exception for snap rolls or aileron rolls to allow for deviation there. The CG must stay horizontal. That's the rule. Well, then that appears to be to contradict a little bit what it says about snap rolls, which is when the roll ends, it must resume the prior flight path. That's talking about 45s, right? No, a flight path is horizontal and radius. Attitude is 45 or vertical. Which which rule are you number? I, I don't have the rule number in front of me. These are these are basically distilled out of the rule book, but I took the language and either copied it verbatim or or just barely summarized it. So there is at least in the snap roll section, I think some acknowledgement that the aircraft will leave a horizontal flight path during the snap. So it's a good question. I don't think we can solve it here. Uh, I will take it offline though, and um, and talk to some more folks uh, and maybe some of you again and see where we come out on it. I would not hold my breath for any kind of change before nationals just because I think this is not a, a question that gets answered quickly. Yeah, well, you know, maybe not so much a change as a clarification. Again, we wanna try to be on the same I, I, I hear you, uh, duly noted, and um, I'll start kicking around with folks uh, tomorrow. We'll see what we find out. Thanks. Yeah, no, thank you guys. Good discussion. Okay, spins, spins, spins. Um, rule book says you must see simultaneous motion about all three axes, roll, pitch, and yaw. So something along those lines or from inverted, something like that. Okay, again. And it is one point per five degrees of yaw and or pitch and or roll until all until you see motion on all three axes. And that can be hard to pick up. So you got to watch the spin entry like a hawk. Um, but we've all seen aircraft that nose drop and then rotate or someone kicks early and then it stalls. Um, and those are all one in five downgrades. If you do not believe that a true spin was achieved in terms of auto rotation, it's a hard zero, uh, PZ for unlimited. And if the aircraft rolls 90 or more before the nose drops, so how many times have you seen this? Right, where it's basically a rudder activated roll and then the nose drops. That's a forced entry, also a hard zero. Okay. And it would also be a hard zero under the uh, um, rule that says any error more than 90 degrees. All right, if auto rotation ceases early and they have to aileron the rest, one point per five degrees. However, during the spin, there's no deduction for changes to the pitch angle or rotation rate, right, as the aircraft oscillates around. When the spin itself is finished, the aircraft must pitch to a vertical down. Okay, wing should be parallel to the horizon, not dragging a wing. And the rate, the direction, excuse me, of the spin is determined by the rotation on the roll axis. Well, if you're doing an upright spin and I hit left rudder, I'm also getting left roll. That one's not a big mystery. The question is when you're inverted and you get this, 
are we looking at the yaw or are we looking at the roll? And the rule book says you look at the roll. And this matters only if there is a roll after the spin on the downline. And then you need to know if it's rolling in the same or opposite direction as the spin. And this is pretty easy in my experience to see from the ground as to which way the aircraft is rolling at the start of the inverted spin. And then you could tell on the downline, same or opposite. All good on that? Okay, we're making even better time than I'd hoped for. So good news for everybody. All right, directionality. If there is a line drawn on the x-axis, it must be flown upwind or downwind as drawn. With exceptions for turns, obviously they're changing axis, right? Um, hammerhead pivot can go upwind or downwind and the same with the flop and the tail slide. For the y-axis, when you hey, enter- are you, uh, what, are you still on the spin slide? Are you, have you transitioned? I did, the new slide says directionality. Um, maybe it just didn't get to you yet. Let me back up and go forward one more time in case that- And, and I have a, I have a, we had something interesting. Could you go back to the spins? Yeah. Uh, we had an interesting discussion uh, a couple of days ago uh, at my airport about the um, rolls after spins. And we were specifically talking about the unlimited sequence figure five is a down P loop that starts inverted with a inverted spin. And then after the inverted spin on the downline, there's another half roll. Okay. And the discussion was uh, that uh, the person appeared to have a long after the roll after the spin, that it was you know significantly longer and having be the roll centered on the downline. And then the discussion transitioned to um, one person said that, well, well, wait a minute, after spins, there is no uh, requirement for a subsequent roll to be centered on the subsequent downline. And the Correct. other person said, uh, well, wait a minute, yeah, it is supposed to be. So we ended up looking it up, but I think it's interesting because everyone was a se relatively senior judge and there was a, a difference in opinion. It turns out you're right that there isn't any requirement uh, for the subsequent roll after a spin to be centered on the subsequent downline or you know upline or you know downline. Um, but you know it was an interesting discussion point for us, kind of like not having to have um, snaps be centered for gliders. Yes, thank you for bringing that up, and I should have put that on the slide. Um, if there's a spin fall by a roll, the whole long after, short after simply does not apply. I think I said that right, a roll after a spin. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That's a good point. Okay, do you have the directionality slide up now, David? Still not seeing it? Bob sees it. Yeah, I, I don't know what to tell you, Dave, the uh, video must, might just be slow getting to your machine there. Um, I'm actually in a uh, one of those shared office workspaces because my home internet is so god awful that I came here to get like professional grade internet. So, um, okay. Now, as I said, on the Y axis, any turn onto the Y axis is at the pilot's discretion. When they go back to the X, they obviously have to be going in the correct direction, up or down wind. If they interrupt between figures on the Y, they may resume in either direction. So just because you interrupted going towards the judges, you can take your break, fly around, come back and resume away from the judges, perfectly fine. Okay. And then for figures that begin and end on the Y axis, the Aresti diagram will either be drawn with the lines opposite like this figure on the left or in the same direction like the figure on the right and must be flown that way. So if you had this Humpty bump quarter up, quarter down, you better pay attention to which direction the plane was going towards you or away from you at the beginning, because it's gotta be same or opposite at the end of the figure. And this is another good place to have your assistants help you out. I object to that rule. <laughs> <laughs> you don't disagree with the interpretation, you just don't like the rule. No, it's an inside joke. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Over my head.
I think we were talking about Oshkosh in 2018. <laughs> okay. No. <laughs> no. All right. So to be clear, that's a uh, waste of time. Star 2021. Okay. If you do that incorrectly, that's a hard zero, correct? That is a hard zero. It's the wrong figure. Oh. Yep. Um, well, Spanky, maybe maybe you can tell me the story over a beer when we're at uh, Salina. I'd love to hear it. No problem. All right. You're by. It was a 10 other than that, Spankster. <laughs> okay. All right. On to zeros and averages. We'll start with averages. Y'all know what it's for. If you cannot give a grade with full confidence, give an A for average. If, if whatever the problem is, maybe affecting the other judges, sun, clouds, um, locusts, whatever, make sure, wave, yell, make sure the chief judge knows it because the chief judge is going to look around and make sure somebody scored the figure. If not, we got to stop the competitor and get them to refly the figure. Okay, so back in the day, there were zeros. And then we had 0, 0.0 and hard zero. And now we have PZ. So now we got potentially three kinds. Good news, everybody but unlimited, we still only have two. A 0, 0.0 is just cumulative deductions of 10 or more where I just run out of fingers, nothing left. That's a 0, 0.0. It's just an accumulation of little things here and there, or maybe big things here and there that use up all 10 of your points, so sorry. Okay, and the scoring program treats it like any other numerical score. It gets averaged in with everybody else's. If it's a hard zero, more than half the judges must agree. Otherwise, Jasper tosses those out and just substitutes an average. Okay, but at nationals and only at nationals, chief judges are required to count the hard zeros and mark the CHZ column, which I'll show you in a moment on the special nationals only judges penalty sheet, okay? Regardless of what kind of zero you give out, you must put something in the remarks column, okay? For a couple of reasons. Uh, one, uh, zeros are obviously more controversial than other scores. Two, there's a possibility that you've given out the wrong kind of zero or your recorder recorded the wrong kind of zero. And so the reason in the remarks column will help us sort that out if need be. Okay, and uh, Hector, I'm speaking for you here, but I think the unlimited chief will use those remarks as well to make sure that the PZ is being applied appropriately as opposed to the HZ. Right, now for nationals, are the PZs and HZs gonna be scored differently like they would be in SIVA? In SIVA, they're two different animals, but I guess for, for, for our nationals, HZ and PZ have the same weight, equal the same thing. Yes, and I'm going to cover that in just a moment, but the, the short answer to your question is, is yes. All right. You're sure. So, yes, I am sure because we're putting the scores into Jasper, and Jasper has no concept of what a PZ is, and so anything marked PZ on a Form A is going to be entered as Hotel Zulu instead. Okay. Then there's the magic of what happens when they re-enter all those scores into ACRO, but that's out of scope for this discussion. Okay. Um, so here, this looks like a chief judge penalty form that you'd see at any contest, but there's a CHZ column here. And I suppose you could apply that if a competitor starts a figure behind you, right? That's a chief, chef, chief judge zero. Or if they were to bust a deadline, I don't know that we have one. That's a chief judge zero. But if there's a conference, eh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, when this when the A forms get back to the chief's table, and this applies to all categories, when they get back to the chief's table, the chief looks through, or the chief assistant, and if there's a majority hard zero, meaning more than half, then at the chief's table, you check the CHZ box. Why do we do this? The PNP says so. Is this really needed? I have my doubts. But um, there it is. There you have it. Okay. Reasons for a hard zero, omitting a figure, adding a figure, or just flat out the wrong figure. Any angular error, pitch yaw or roll of 90 degrees or more, right? So if I'm supposed to do a, a full snap and I do a snap and a quarter, never made that mistake, haha. That's a hard zero wrong figure as opposed to a snap and 80 degrees, which would be a 0, 0.0. 
Make sense? So 0, 0.0 would be angular errors of more than 45 degrees. But once you pass 90 degrees, then we say it's the whole wrong figure, and then it's a hard zero. All right, we've talked about the figure-specific criteria, like sliding half a fuselage length and a tail slide. Failure to meet those is a hard zero, snapping during a roller, OK? Um, once a figure has been horribly botched, the pilot is entitled to do an implicit interruption, which means fixing their heading and or a half roll to get them from upright to inverted, inverted back to upright, whatever, to fix the aircraft's heading and attitude so that it can proceed. Um, we had this happen at the Western Open contest in Colorado, a glider pilot basically fell out of a figure going 180 degrees the wrong way. Um, and what they did was stuff in a 180 turn and then keep going. And several judges tried to say that was an, an inserted figure. Okay, it was not, it was an implicit break. And the pilot had to do something to get going the right direction. They're not required to wag out, go away and wag back in again. They just did the 180 turn and kept going. Okay, so bear that in mind if, if a figure is, is really messed up to the max. Then, unlimited can I, I'm people. Sorry, can I, yeah, go ahead. Can I uh, interrupt you just a second? Yeah, go ahead, Doctor. This is going back to the previous form. So I, I hate to shift gears on you, but. The confirmed hard zeros, the CHZ, not the chief judges, but the confirmed hard confirmed. zero. Confirmed, okay. Okay, so if you have a mixture of a minority of HZs and you have a couple of PZs that would make, <clears throat> make that a majority figure, how would you deal with that as a chief judge? Sorry, Jasper, just say it one more time. It's gonna matter for Jasper. Yeah, I think I would do what Jasper does which is set the averages aside, look at what's left, see if more than half the judges said, ha said hard zero. If so, I would check the box, otherwise I'd leave the box blank. Okay, no, I guess what I meant was, uh, say three of the judges gave it a hard zero. Yes. And two of them, gave, two, of, two judges gave it a P zero and they had their uh, oh, oh. doing it. Okay, so you don't have a majority hard zeros, but you do have a majority zeros if you have P zeros and HZs, PZs and HZs. But right. here in Jasper, in Jasper, a PZ is gonna be counted as, an, as a hard zero. Right, so in that situation, you would still call it a CHZ, right? For the, for the sake of the four. I, I, think, would. We'd, I think we'd have to. Yeah, I, it doesn't right. make sense Whereas to do it otherwise. In Siva, it would I not be. The, I thought the reason for a judge's uh, brief over a mix of zeros was to go over the basic facts as known of the figures and see if anybody wants to reconcile the PZs and the AZs. Yeah, I think the first thing I would look for, uh, that occurred to me um, when Hector was saying that, the first thing I would look for was were the PZs and HZs uh, properly assigned. I'd look in the remarks column if it was didn't snap and there's an HZ score and this is again, unlimited only then I would go back to that judge and go, didn't snap as a PZ, not an HC. So would you please fix your form? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and that would be the most likely scenario, I think, for a mix of PZs and HCs. Um, not that it couldn't occur for other reasons, but that's probably the most likely. But uh, even if you got to that situation, if that, there were... Um, if, I'm sorry, Hector. You know, just in a case where... You know, you can't resolve the discrepancy. Each judge is going to say, no, I'm going to keep mine the way that I put it down. I'm not changing it. Mm -hmm. so, I'm not sure what, what the right answer is for that. Well, I yeah. think the, the question, though, is if you have two PZs, two HZs, and three scores, what's the chief judge supposed to put in the CHZ column? And I would say, I mean, at that point, when we are like Peggy was talking about, we would put the PZs in with the HZs, and that means a combination of two HZs, two PZs, and three scores, that ends up equaling a, a, a you know, chief HZ, because four of seven said that it was a not, well, not correctly flown, flown figure. That makes sense. That's probably how I would tend to handle it. I will say, uh, as somebody pointed out, it it's, doesn't matter in the least for Jasper, because it's going to treat PZ and HZ exactly the same. 
whether it matters when we get into acro and whether the CHZ column has anything to do with acro, I don't know. Yes, it does. But the, the PZ is handled like a 0, 0.0 with no downside to the judge. Okay. So you would have a you would have scores for then five of the figures and uh, two AZs. Gotcha. Okay. And we I, we could probably trust Acro to sort that out because this must have occurred at some point in time, I would guess. And DJ, this is this is Doug. Yeah. Doug. Uh, so the question has been kicked around quite a bit, and uh, just bringing up a point that we were we ask all of our judges to appropriately use PZs. Uh, uh, because we're not sure what uh, what ACRO does. Uh, when we when we uh, went around and asked the questions, does it really make a difference? And if I'm not aspiring to be a national or international judge, why do I care? Well, the reason you want to care is because it will help the judges, or it may help the judges who are trying to be international judges. So we ask that uh, that the PZs be applied uh, by all the judges, whether they plan to be an aspirant or not, and. Uh, and because we don't really know what's going on there, uh, it, it, it becomes somewhat of a question. But uh, the PZs in essence in Jasper are HZs. So you just, you just uh, you'd add them up, HZs and PZs uh, account for the same thing. Thank and you. Then the yeah, then that would be a confirmed hard zero if the combination was greater than 50%. Right, and I think Bill had the perfect comment. I mean, that, that's, you know, his comment about how it works is, was, you know, apropos. Okay, yeah, good Good to pre-think these things. I appreciate it. And thanks for your comment, Doug. I meant to mention that and I just spaced it out that we are asking all unlimited judges to uh, assign PZs where appropriate for the sake of the other judges who are trying to qualify for SEVA contests. Okay, so we went through the reasons for a hard zero, omitting, adding, wrong figure, more than 90 degrees off some axis, failure to meet specific criteria, uh, but an inserted heading correction or half roll is not an added figure. There are exactly four cases where PZ applies, again, power, unlimited power only. Didn't snap, didn't spin, didn't slide far enough, or a snap in a roller. And P, obviously, uh, if you don't know, stands for perception zero, meaning you could look at the tape and two perfectly uh, qualified judges could disagree as to whether a snap snapped or not, hence the P for perception. But for those of you doing unlimited, those are the only four cases you need to worry about. Didn't snap, didn't spin, didn't slide far enough, snap and a roller. Right. And PZs are not conferenced. Right, PZs are not conferenced. Okay. All right, at the end of each sequence presentation, this is the one um, score that by design is subjective, entirely subjective, zero to 10. Uh, but obviously, as always, you want to be consistent in your subjectivity. That always cracks me up. Um, the criteria are balance on the x-axis. You don't want to see everything down here. You don't want to see everything over there. You want to see it more or less, however much of the box the pilot uses, you want it to be evenly distributed. You want to see them manage the wind, not get blown into the judges or away from the judges or stuck at one end of the box. You want distance and altitude to be at the best viewing angles. So low when they're close to you, high when they're far away. You always want to kind of be looking like this, not having to, you know, look way off to the side or way up in the air. Okay. And consistent pacing of the figures. Those are your four criteria in the rule book. I want to teach judges school. I always recommend, and when I'm on the line, I always do give the first competitor a very middle of the road mark. Um, I don't want to make them feel bad, so it might be a six or a seven, but you got to leave headroom because just because the first competitor impressed you, if you gave him a nine five, where do you go from there, right? Um, so given that it's completely subjective, leave yourself some, some wiggle room in both the uh, up and down directions for presentation. Okay, now gliders. And again, everybody except the unlimited judges are going to uh, get to judge gliders and Things are a little different there. Um, for sportsmen and intermediate, 45 degree lines as drawn by Arresti are really flown at 30. I've long contended that we're great at seeing horizontals. We're pretty good at seeing verticals. We're highly mediocre at 45s. 30s are a real treat to try and guess if they're steep or shallow, okay? Um, 
do your best. That's all we can ask. And maybe don't be too trigger happy on those. But that's only sportsman and intermediate glider. The advanced and unlimited gliders, which are um, flying in, in the line that I'm chiefing, will fly true 45s, must fly true 45s to, to avoid downgrades. Okay. Another big difference, so-called horizontal lines between figures. If you're in a glider, maybe flown at any reasonable angle. We litigated this, <laughs> again, with an Air Force cadet who came out of a figure 30 degrees nose low, which if you recall is a 45, this was a sportsman glider, 30 degrees nose low and claimed that was a reasonable angle. And the next maneuver was a pitch to 45 down, which was really 30. And they were already at 30. So how could we tell when the figure started? And we decided that was not a reasonable angle. Okay. And uh, I think it was uh, just a deduction, uh, not a hard zero in that case. But, you know, you'll see them fly five degrees nose up or down, 10 degrees, something like that to either gain or lose airspeed as needed for the subsequent figures. Okay, okay. good for him for trying. Yeah, I guess, right? <laughs> um, I, I don't know why he needed to though, because if you ever push the nose of a glider down 30 degrees, it wraps up pretty darn quick, but that's neither here nor there. Um, now, though, so they may well come out of a loop, five degrees nose down, let's say, and then they must maintain that constant angle into the next figure, one in five if they change it, okay? Now, if you had a loop followed by a slow roll on a horizontal line, followed by a hammer, they'd have to come out of the loop, five degrees nose down, that's fine. They go into the next figure, five degrees nose down, that's fine. They stay five degrees nose down through the roll on the horizontal line, still fine, and then now they have energy for their hammer. But you cannot get five degrees nose down, go, whoa, going too fast, and, and suddenly kick to level and go to the next figure. Okay, that would be a one in five change. All right, unlike power, snap rolls do not need to be centered on interior lines. Okay, and the reason for that is that gliders have such a narrow speed window in which they can snap and they lose so much energy in the snap, they're just happy if they have any line at all after the snap. And so they do not need to center their snaps and the one, two, three rule does not apply. If a roll or in my opinion, a roll combination has a snap in it, um, then no need to center it, okay? As Peggy pointed out, whereas a power plane must back up half a fuselage length, gliders just need a visible amount of slide, okay? If you think they slid one inch, good enough. And then in the horizontal eights, the radii need not occur at the same altitude. So in power, you'd have to have them like this. In glider, they could be like that. Okay. I got a question, DJ. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. Figure three in the intermediate glider known is a Immelman. Okay. So the entry line, I presume, is going to be five or something degrees down, nose down. Okay. At the top of that half loop and after the half roll, is that line is supposed to be matching the angle of the entry line? That's a good or question. Can that be any other angle? It, yeah. So at, at the end of the figure, going into the figure, it can be any reasonable angle. At the end, it could be any reasonable angle. They do not need to match. So okay, you may well right. see them. If it's, let's say it's a, an element followed by a spin, right? That would not be an that unlikely a, combination. Yep. Oh, well, that was a good guess then. Um, so they may come in nose down to get some smash for the Immelman and then finish nose up so that they decelerate for the spin. Okay. Okay. Doesn't so have to match. That's the do not one. need to match. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's a good example. Okay, on gliders, those are the weirdnesses in gliders. Um, this is all the uh, in the quick reference for the rule book actually almost this whole presentation so far is. So it, it would still behoove you to take a quick glance at that. Uh, again, I, it's difficult. I know if you don't judge gliders very often, even those of us who do still have a real mental gear shift when, uh, when they uh, bring the glider in. Also, if you've never judged a glider before and someone says off toe, you better find that glider right then and there because if you look the if you look away for a moment, you'll never find it again. If the if the sky is a little bit milky or the the sun's in your eyes, you'll just never find it again. Uh, DJ, this is Doug again. Just a just a comment for all the judges: be very familiar with the glider figures because we have gliders flying. <laughs> I've never seen it before in uh, sportsman, intermediate, advanced, 
And uh, we do have unlimited gliders flying. They're just gonna fly with the advanced category. And we have a glider schedule for the four minute freestyle. That's happened uh, once before that I know of. So just be aware of uh, and refresh yourself on all the figures. Yep, yep, very good, thanks. Also, um, FYI for the judges is we will be interspersing gliders with power. And the rule of thumb, not not set in stone, but the rule of thumb will be once the glider gets to altitude, they're the next one into the box. Because if we're not careful, we can end up um, waiting on glide. We can go through all the power and still have several gliders left. And then we're waiting for them to get towed up and released and recover the tow plane, hook up the next glider. And then the contest starts to bog down. So what you're going to have is two separate clipboards, power clipboard and a glider clipboard. And the chief will yell, gliders next. And you put down the one clipboard and pick up the pick up the other one, okay? And so we're so, just gonna shoehorn them in where we can, yes? So if I understood Doug right, if you're judging advanced, be prepared to judge a couple unlimited gliders. Correct, affirmative. All right, I, would like, I would like to even take that one step further because uh, it appears uh, that there are gonna be uh, approximately 20 gliders, give or take a couple, and uh, we may have to adjust categories. So it's possible, although unlikely, that we may have, uh, uh, because intermediate is such a small category compared to the others, that we may move advanced gliders and unlimited gliders into intermediate. So if I was a, a glider judge, I'd be prepared to, uh, to judge, uh, if I was an intermediate or advanced glider judge, I'd be prepared to judge all three. And DJ, uh, we won't make that decision until uh, final registration and uh, you and uh, the volunteer coordinator and of course gliders will be involved in it. Okay, yep, sounds good. Yeah, all this is a little bit fluid, um, depends on who shows up, uh, weather, all that good stuff. So um, we will have to be flexible at some point, no doubt. Okay, so when everything does go to hell in a handbasket and um, you know somebody skips a line on their card, your, your assistant, doesn't say the figure right, uh, you forgot to switch from power clipboard to glider clipboard. Anyway, just do the best you can. Try and get uh, re-engaged with the flight, figure out where it is, uh, and then give out as many A's as necessary. Uh, the chief will be watching, and if everybody was befuddled at the same time, we may need to break off the flight and, and get them to restart. Um, but that's pretty rare. I like talking about benefit of the doubt. Um, if there's, and this is right out of the rule book, if there's any question about exactly what was observed, the benefit, benefit of the doubt shall always be given in the competitor's favor. And we're going to go through an example of that in a moment. That implies that if a competitor's action can be understood in more than one way, the interpretation most favorable to the competitor will be chosen. Okay, so you may recognize this segment of uh, an Arresti sequence from question one on this year's RNC exam, which generated no end of, um, I'm gonna say energetic emails and discussions uh, from the people who had to take the test. And probably maybe the most insulting thing of all was making this question number one before you even got warmed up on the test, but that's neither here nor there. Okay, so let's take I'm going to call it scenario one. The competitor comes in, they fly figure nine. It's fine. It gets scored, whatever it gets scored. They do the three pull Humpty and the three quarter inside snap. They exit on the Y. And then out of the blue, instead of the roller, they fly a hammerhead with a quarter down. And you go, what the? That's not right. Hard zero. And but they're headed the correct direction. They fly the shark tooth. Are we all agreed that's one hard zero? All opposed? It's one hard zero. Scenario two, and this is what actually happened. The competitor came in, they flew figure nine just fine, got scored, whatever downgrades, exit on the Y, and then on the Y axis, they flew a shark tooth instead of the roller. Judges all went, well, that's no roller, that's a hard zero. Then the pilot recombobulated themselves, came back in the proper direction on the X and flew the shark tooth. How many zeros is that? Yeah, it's one hard zero. Um, you could, 
make the perfectly legitimate argument that um, they skipped 10, flew 11 on the wrong axis, and then flew 11 again. So that's either two or three hard zeros, depending on how you look at it. But the more favorable interpretation is they flew nine, they did something in place of 10 that just happened to look a lot like figure 11, hard zero, and then they did figure 11. Okay, and that's what, that's what the test was getting at, is that benefit of the doubt forces us to give the competitor the least number of zeros that you can for the circumstances that you saw. Okay. And then on the notes on uh, figure 11, you put nice correction. Yeah, good recovery, right? Yep. Actually, that's kind of a, a bit of a booby prize when everyone claps you on the back and says, that's a great recovery from that screw up you did. Okay. All right. Um, it still earns an interruption too. Uh, well, depends. I mean, um, yeah, in that case, they would have had to interrupt just to get on the proper axis. Yeah, but that's a chief's call, not a line judge call. Mm -hmm. Okay, Doug, feel free to chime in with anything additional here. But as Doug has mentioned numerous times in calls that I've been on, nationals has been cut from seven days to five and a half. So there will be no warm up figures primary through advanced, probably not for unlimited, but that will be at the contest director's discretion. There will also be no video reviews on the line except for unlimited. And that's because it's team selection. DJ, but, just, uh, DJ, just a clarification. There's a board meeting tomorrow where uh, they, the board will make a determination on uh, the definition of uh, uh, safety and practice figures. So the question is, okay. are they safety figures or practice figures? So I will uh, put out an announcement to the, uh, to the judges. Uh, okay. And there are a couple of others. Uh, and the other one is uh, that regards uh, uh, the the pilots is whether uh, SIVA or um, IEC rules will be used for unknown figures. So those will be determined tomorrow and I'll expedite that information as fast as possible to all the judges. Uh, anything that applies to judges, I'll get to you for, uh, for dis uh, dispersion. Good deal, thanks. Okay. Uh, DJ, another point on your benefit of a doubt. If the figure is a 0, 0.0 and then the pilot does something that turns it into a hard zero, it becomes a hard zero. That's correct. Yeah, that would have been a good thing for me to put back on the zero slide, um, wherever that was. But um, if you have both a hard zero and a 0, 0.0 in the same figure, the hard zero takes precedence. And uh, that's a Dave Watson rule change if memory serves. Um, okay, so uh, we are, but Doug, we are not gonna, this is correct, right? We're not gonna do video reviews on the line except for team selection unlimited. Uh, however, competitors is, may still use, thanks. Uh, competitors may still use video evidence and protests. And a reminder, and I don't wanna encourage everybody to go nuts with this, but as a way of counterbalancing the lack of video reviews, if you really think you saw something the other judges didn't, um, judges may also file protests at no cost, at which time a video evidence can be can be viewed. But we really don't want to, we can't afford to bog down the contest with a lot of video review on the line. Okay. Now, the topic of conferences came up earlier, and those are also a little bit different at nationals as a result of uh, PNP 503. It says that either a chief judge or a grading judge can call a conference. How the grading judge would know that there's a confusion and a conference is needed, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, grading judges do have the right to do that. All right, and then rather than as we do in regional contests with the line judges adjusting their form A's, the chief will simply mark the CHZ confirmed hard zero box on the penalty form or not, depending on the outcome of the conference. Why does this need to be different? I'm really not sure. And I may try and push a push through a change to the PNPs for next year, but we're not going to change horses midstream. We'll do what the PNP says to do. And we don't use conference averages. Right. So that's right, because the line judges don't change the form A's, right? So they don't go from um, a hard zero up to a conference average, or they don't go from a numeric score down to a hard zero. They just leave their form A's the way it is, the way they are, and it's the chief who marks it on that special penalty form. And that's going to be something we need to brief the scorers on, uh, right? The scoring uh, data entry people on for sure. Okay. 
I'm just puzzling yeah. now how you put that into Jasper once you've done that. But Jay, Jay, can you back up and go through that again? I don't think I followed you. The conferences? Yes, and, and the conferences and, and no conference averages. Sure. So normally, let's take the normal case, right? We all huddle around, and uh, I convince you, Bill, that the roller went to the outside when it should have gone to the inside. And you go, dang, DJ, you're right, and you change your 6.0 to a hard zero, okay? Or vice versa, you convince me that it was rolled in the proper direction. I take my hard zero and I make it into a C for conference average, okay? And then it goes into Jasper, and we're all friends again. Um, we're not doing that. What we're doing instead is going around and saying, okay, who among us thinks that a hard zero should be changed to an average or vice versa? We look and see if there's a majority of hard zeros. The chief, the line judges don't change their A's, but the chief goes to that special nationals only penalty form and checks the CHZ box for confirmed hard zero. Okay. Okay. And Fair. And I saw Doug, I think, take a quick note when I said we're going to have to brief the scorers on that, because otherwise, if they put things right into Jasper, then um, Jasper is going to do what it does, and Jasper won't know that uh, we changed the score as a result of a conference. Okay, so to wrap it up, it's going to be a busy, fast-paced week, uh, at least we hope so. And... Um, so it's going to be a lot of pressure to be present for every briefing or make alternate arrangements in advance. Jerry, I've already got you on my phone calendar to give you your special briefing when you're not able to attend um, for whichever one that was uh, advanced free, I think it was. Doesn't matter. I'll, I'll get with you beforehand. Um, we're going to, um, Alice is going to crack the whip uh, to have people at their designated pickup spot at the designated time to get to the line. And uh, we want all the briefings to be done before we get to the line. So one set of judges stands up, the next set sits down, and we're back in business. No long changeovers in between. Okay. Um, we really appreciate um, you all taking an evening here, um, being volunteers at the contest. Um, and I just encourage you to put the same intensity and seriousness into judging that you do into your flying. We don't, you don't get grades like you do when you fly, but. Um, uh, the attention you pay really, uh, really matters to the, uh, to the competitors a lot. That said, fun will be tolerated to some degree. DJ, just one quick comment, if, if I may. Sir, I'm all done. Uh, just a comment to all the judges. The chief judges have made a request that uh, the judges' chairs be numbered, one through seven, and uh, that you sit in your, if you're the number two judge, please sit in the number two chair. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm asking, please comply with this without grumbling beneath your breath. The reason for it is uh, organization and speed. What we're trying to do is instead of running scores across the, the airport in a van, like in the good old days, we're going to use some technology and hopefully uh, get the, the uh, scores to the score rapidly uh, via uh, digital format in order to be able to release the uh, forms to the pilots in a digital format. So everybody can have as much information as soon as possible for the purposes of, of uh, uh, protest periods and getting those protest periods uh, started and ended as fast as possible so we can get to free unknown figure selections because that's one of the biggest time constraints that we have with the contest. So uh, please, in this little quirky thing of please sit in your, your judge's seat, it's just the first building block in a whole series of where we're trying to eliminate wasted time um, that we've had in prior contests so uh, we can be efficient with scores and maximize the amount of time for the pilots. Because when it's all said and done, uh, our objective is to create a good experience for our pilots. And I do agree with, uh, with uh, DJ, uh, you know, I appreciate all that you do as judges. And DJ, uh, this is the first time you've held a judging class online. So I would ask that the judges, if you appreciate it and like doing it on, uh, a Zoom meeting instead of doing it a couple hours before national starts, please give us some feedback and let us know so we can either uh, say yes or no uh, for the, uh, the coming years. Thank you very much, DJ, and all the judges for attending. All right, thanks, Doug. Anyone have anything else you want to add before we go? We're still inside our 90 minutes, which is great. DJ? I have a DJ. question if you can hear yep. me. Oh. Um, okay, Souter first. Okay, 
Uh, this is a question. No, I'm the other Doug, but the question for the real Doug, does he care which side are uh, recorders and uh, and um, assistants sit on, like left or right? Will, will that affect the way the they plan to pick up the forms? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Just as they as they run by, they just want to go from uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, so it organizes it for. They're going to take uh, data pictures and send it across. So, DJ, I think whether a judge wants to have the uh, assistant on one side of the recorder on the other is up to that judge. Sh shouldn't matter. Yeah, I, I have my preference. I suspect the rest of you do as well. Uh, Dave Watson, did, were you asking a question? Uh, well, I was actually following back on something we left kind of open, and okay. I stand corrected. So there is some ambiguous language that we can clean up over the next coming year as far as the rule book, but there is a very explicit clarification as far as this horizontal line with a snap roll on it. You know, uh -huh. we talked about if it's 100 feet low or 100 feet high. There's a clarification in rule 2822.8. 28.22.8 and it says clarification a snap roll may cause a lateral or vertical displacement of the aircraft relative to its original flight path okay, okay. such displacements will not be downgraded as long as the displaced flight path remains parallel to the original flight path okay so that applies to both 45s and horizontal clearly that's that's non-ambiguous language there. There is some other stuff before that that I was influenced by, but this clarification stands me corrected. Okay, good. Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, we can go back and look at the rule book and see if uh, we can avoid that that potential confusion there, where it says one thing one place and something else somewhere else. Anybody DJ, else? This, yeah, yeah, DJ. This is Linda. Hi, Linda. I have a, quest a question about the tail slides. Do we still follow the rule that if the cheat is visible on the vertical up, it shall also be downgraded or assumed for the downline? So if you give a, a penalty for the cheat on the up, you should or do also downgrade the vertical. It was in for years and I don't see it in there now. But the reason I'm asking is that for unlimited, if we're following the SIVA rules, you would downgrade that. And in advance, if somebody puts a slide in there, then those judges would not downgrade it there. Okay. Um, so as far as figure criteria goes, it's 100% IAC rules. And what I think I hear you asking is, someone's gonna do a wheels up slide, so they start a little negative going yes. up. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, that's a downgrade for the up line. And then when yes. the plane starts backing up, in my opinion, that's a second line. And if the cheat doesn't change, it's a second downgrade. If they magically cheated on the way up and then fixed it on the way down, I would mm -hmm. only give one deduction, but that would be pretty magical. Okay. The, the and SIVA, the, SIVA okay. rules say that, it, well, I, I, I don't see in our rules that it still says you, you will downgrade it on both the up and the down. Okay. Uh, DJ, yeah. if, I, if, if, if I can, if I can comment on that, I think the point that uh, Linda may be getting to, and Linda, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that the uh, the IEC rules apply on judging. However, uh, if the board so decides tomorrow night to leave the SIVA unknown figures in place for advanced and unlimited, the figure is allowed, but it will be judged under IEC criteria. Got it. Linda, does that clarify it? I got it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I have a question on that because Linda, that was an interesting point. You you brought up that the five degrees, five degrees in SIVA Unlimited compared to IAC Nationals, they were different. If it was five and five, they got judged different. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> no, I mean I was trying to interpret what you what you, you what your question was. But you said under one circumstances, the five and five would be a double downgrade. But then you mentioned well, in, our in IAC C advanced. In SIVA, it says if you see the vertical cheat there on the up line, you um, also penalize it for the down line. Right. In IAC, it does not say that any longer, and it used to. Ah. My opinion, it's two lines. 
Well, uh, to Linda's point, it used to be three lines. You had the up line, you had the internal line before the swap, and then you had the exit line or the vertical down to exit the figure. It used to be three lines that could be done. And I remember uh, from the Greg Dungan and uh, Wes Liu days, I remember uh, that was a trick question that would show up every couple of years in the PNP. Or excuse me, the RNC exam. I guess the point is you look for it and you downgrade it as necessary. <laughs> yeah, well, for, DJ, for, what's... I, for our IAC rules. Yes. Right. Well, and DJ, what's the one thing where you always impressed in your judges school is be consistent? Uh, DJ, yeah, this is Tom Rhodes. I had a question. When you were talking about the presentation scores, you said, give yourself some wiggle room. Yes, I didn't know what you meant by that. The first competitor comes in, you feel like maybe you made a 9-5. Are you saying back off a little bit? But that would be penalizing the first or second competitor. I don't know what you meant by give yourself wiggle room. So bear in mind that these are subjective scores, right? And if you think the first one you know, was a 9.5, and the next guy is twice as good. What can you do from there? You can only give a half point more. I don't think it's penalizing the first competitor to give them a six because you may rank everybody else lower. You may, you may not hand out anything better than that six or seven. Well, okay. As long as you're giving someone more points for better presentation, fewer points for worse presentation, I think you've done your job ranking the pilots. Go ahead, Spanky. Yeah, <clears throat> I wasn't going to say anything because I was trying to expedite this meeting, but <laughs> I wholeheartedly disagree with that comment. If the first pilot comes in and flies a dope ass sequence and he gets mm -hmm. nine, five or 10, he gets a nine, five or 10. He shouldn't be penalized because he's first to fly. If someone else comes in and flies an equally as good sequence, then they also get a nine, five or 10. You don't need to give yourself room. Um, it's going to be obvious. You had your criteria and you, uh, on presentation. And if you see it, that's it. There's no reason to talk any further. I mean, there's you can't penalize the first pilot for going first. Well, I, think my opinion, I don't really want to get into this, but yeah. So I, I, listen, I think, Dave, if I may, listen, it's only a recommendation. It's my personal philosophy on these things. Um, I'd hate for someone to come out and really do a good job on presentation. And I give them a ten, and then the next person does even better, and I have nowhere so to go. So what? I, they both I, get ten. Well, I know, but the other guy should have gotten a 12 or a 13. I can't give it. Not necessarily. Or a All right. So we, we, <laughs> then, I, I, I've, I've chased, I've chased this around right. with other people. Yeah, it's just a philosophy and a recommendation. I would last word on the subject since I'm the meeting moderator is I don't think <laughs> you're penalizing somebody because it's not like 10 degrees off or whatever. Um, you're simply giving them a number and ranking the others relative. But uh, as I say, merely a philosophy and a guideline, use it, don't use it whatever turns you on, it's all good. All right, I would say, I would say that, uh, I would say that, you know, we, this isn't our first rodeo though. I mean, we're all national judges. Yes, indeed. And so I, I think Spanky's got a point and I think Tom's got a point as well. It's not our first time. If you see somebody and they knock it out of the park, if you don't have to give them a five, but you might not have to give them a 10 either. But I mean, you know, we're experienced judges and, you know, we just have to use our best judgment. And, and, and I think we can, you know, make it work out for the people who really do it well. Yep. Yep. That's a good point. And, and I certainly respect that. Um, Y'all wouldn't be judging nationals if you didn't have a ton of experience and, uh, and be respected in what you do. So I get all that. All right, uh, let's wrap it up. Um, uh, again, appreciate y'all taking the time and uh, look forward to seeing you in Salina. Thanks. Hey, Doug Bartlett, if you have a second to stay on, uh, I'd do a you know one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one if you had a minute. If you don't mind calling him, because otherwise I got to stay here and oh, be on a call with yeah. you. Never mind. <laughs> good job, DJ. All right, thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Good, good job. Thanks, Thank everybody.